and welcome to another edition of Live from My Mother's Basement. My Mother's Basement. Well, I don't know whose basement it is. Uh, unfortunately, we're actually not in the basement, which is in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. We just found out just now we're both friends with an acquaintance who actually happens to be from not only Scotch Plains, New Jersey, but Jersey City. Yep which is really the city that I was born in. And then we moved out to the suburbs like every other person on the run. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are inside the Tropicana Casino Hotel and Spa. High above the uh, Laugh Factory. Where you're High above the Laugh tonight. Factory. That's right. Yep. We got some shows at the Laugh Factory tonight. And one of my favorite entertainers and one of my favorite things to do is to look up my friend, actor, writer, comedian, impersonator, Impressionist John D. Dominica, everybody, put your hands together for John for coming out and hanging out with me at five yep. o'clock, eight o'clock on the East Coast. We here. Yep, two paisans doing a doing a podcast. Hi, everybody, <laughs> John D. Dominico. I think it's really great because comic com comedically, we actually almost look like we're related. <laughs> I I know. Know. When I sat down next to you, I was like, I really know, like, holy yeah. cow, we got the same round face, and we have that same nose, that same Italian nose. All I got to do is cave in and shave my head, <laughs> and away we go. I'm, like, I'm looking like a hippie right now. <laughs> That's a hippie? I got to, yeah, I got to shave it for New York, so. No, it's, I think it looks good. Up. I think you look good when you do it like I gotta this. I got to have a little bit. That little just, bit. Just, just a little, little bit. bit. Just, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. That's an attempt on my De Niro, but <laughs> he's got the, the De Niro De Niro. John, where are you originally from? I'm from Ambler, Pennsylvania. Uh, my grandfather was came in from Italy to Rochester, wanted a warmer climate, and he said, I have to go someplace more tropical, so he moved to Philadelphia. And uh, that's the truth. <laughs> wait for it, wait yeah, for I was like, well, really? Yeah, you couldn't have gone somewhere else. That took me 30 but, seconds. Yeah. But he went to uh, went to Philadelphia, and then my dad was born there. My mom's from Chestnut Hill. Um, they met and got married, and then they moved to beautiful Ambler, Pennsylvania. And predominantly, it's a predominantly Italian town, so I grew up with a lot of... It's yeah, funny, sometimes you find Italian entertainers or... Uh, um, singers and dancers and whatnot, and they come from a uh, predominantly Italian neighborhood. Yeah, it's a, it's the truth. Because Scotch Plains um, was a predominantly Italian neighborhood because so many Italians from Italy moved into that neighborhood. They took it over, and uh, it's wonderful. There's areas here in uh, Vegas that are predominantly Italian, or they were at one time. Right. And uh, it's great growing up in those towns because... You know, I don't know where you got your characters from when you talk about that, but that's the way I would get my characters as well because you they were in your family and they were on your street corner. Yeah, and it was a predominantly... Um, Ambler was like South Philly. It was all row homes, hundreds and hundreds of row homes. All these people crammed in together and they would hang out. In the, you know, it was the late 60s, over 70s. See, now you, you're going to even have to explain that. <laughs> no, 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 cause, because a lot of people are watching right now don't even know what a row home yeah. is. That's extremely East Coast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah you can never, you're not going to find a row home in California. No. You, no. You're never going to find a row in home Kentucky. in Kentucky. No. <laughs> you might in find Florida. In, in, in Kentucky, you might find row trailer homes. Trailer homes. <laughs> right. Trailer parks. Yeah. So, yeah. So, basically, if you've ever seen any movies in Brooklyn or Queens or Philadelphia, if you've seen Rocky, if you've seen Rocky, that, those row homes, that's that's what I grew up in. And it was great because people were close to each other. And like I said, a lot of people were Italian. People were outgoing and friendly. And everybody's a character. And you kind of you kind of learn from, learn from that. There is row homes in New Jersey. Yeah. There is sure. row homes in all the outer boroughs. But there are road homes in Philadelphia that I'm sorry, you got to say to yourself, how in the hell do people live like this? Because you are really on top of each other. Yeah. You come out your front door and everybody knows you came out. Oh, and not even because they saw you. You shook their house. Yeah. Oh, and any kind of arguments, everybody heard it. The thing was, my you know, my mother and father, me, my two younger brothers, my older brother, and my sister Carol. This is seven people in a tiny three bedroom house with one bathroom. That's a row home. This hotel room has more bathrooms than the house I grew up in. Row homes, and when you watch Rocky, they're so 
built together and there's nowhere to park. And these are areas where it snows. So in the winter, I don't know how anybody gets around. But I will say this. There is the most powerful sense of community you will ne ever see in the world. And they all like, did you have the type of people like, oh, John, how you doing? Did you hear what happened to Vin? I can't believe it. Are you going to be in church on Sunday? I'll see you on church. I smell the sauce coming from your house. Sounds like everything is great. I'll talk to you soon. They turn around and go, I never liked that guy. <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> my, my dad used to say, you got to keep the peace. You yeah. got to keep the peace. You got to be nice to everybody. So I always thought that's what I was uh, taught. Because you don't want to have any antagonistic feelings towards a neighbor. Right. Because you know, you're going to have to live with them. Exactly. For God knows how long. Is that your cat? Digging into my garbage pail. <laughs> and I was just wondering if maybe, you know. <laughs> but it was great to grow up with like, a, you know, so many kids in a tight little neighborhood. And I have friends, I, you know, I posted something on, I actually posted about being on here tonight with you and people, from, people I grew up with, like from the time I was born commented. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I'm so friends with all those people. You kind of, you know, you, you're so bonded together because you're literally sharing a firewall that's maybe four inches apart. That's the firewall. And like, then your, your neighbor, and your next neighbor, and your next neighbor, and your next neighbor. So you get very close to people. Here's something that you would hear in a row home back in the day. Watch, we'll play this game. He, we, we have never done this before, right? <laughs> play this game. You got any sugar? Or if it was summertime, you wouldn't even knock. You would just walk in. Hey, can you give him a little sugar? you have any milk? Milk? Do you have any milk? Who borrows milk anymore? When you're at, well, we, no, not now. But when you're a kid and you run out, your neighbor is, you know, can we get some milk before we get to the store? You know. I remember my mother going like this. Listen, go downstairs and ask your cousin Josephine for an extra cup of sugar. And then you were afraid. No, Dame Josephine got a mustache. <laughs> She's always going like this yeah, to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's great that we had, even though we had, it was weird, there weren't that many st corner stores, but the few that were there were all great meats and cheeses and hanging and, you know, the, the, the Italian soccer team and uh, the buckets of olives. It was really, it was great. You remember when you went to the corner store? You knew the name of the person working behind the counter, and he knew what family you came from. Oh, yeah. 100%. And he came walking in, and that's when I said, hey, how's your mother? I heard your mother fell down the other day. Tell her, to, you know, the, the, the Super Sada family gives the regards. And what'd you come in here for? <laughs> they already knew. They already knew. You wanted the bullet rolls. We used to call it the bullet roll, which was a nice Italian roll sauce of... Uh, Bread and sausage. You remember when sausage would be in bread? Oh my God, yeah. What, 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 what was it called? Sausage bread. Yeah. Uh, pepperoni bread. It came in the bread. You ordered it that way. It was great. Remember, I'm hungry already. Yeah. Son of a bitch. You guys, see, the thing was, when we had these corner stores, they made the best hoagies. The best hoagies. See, that's Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's a Philly, that's a Philly thing. Now we it's we never point. said We that's never it. said hoagie. But you had sub sub sandwich, sub sandwiches. Bullet roll. It was called a bullet because it was shaped like a bullet. Yeah. After that, it was a lot of crime in the area. <laughs> Your area. <laughs> I remember when we used to have, and I really did have this, and I don't think I'm even old enough to this to have been such a part of my life. But um, you had the piece of wood with the skates underneath it. Oh yeah. And then a, what do they call the thing that held bottles? A crate. A crate. Yeah. A wooden crate with a handle across the top. And for decoration, you took some bottle caps and you put it around and you went up and down the street and it was made of concrete and you made more noise, sparks coming off the wheels. Right? Yeah. Like you were in the 1940s. But it, we were in the 70s. Yeah. Late 60s, 70s. And we yeah. still did baseball cards, you know, bells on the bikes. Because that's all you had. You had a bike. Yeah. That was pretty much it. We there wasn't them. all this stuff now. My my nieces and nephews are the most scheduled, and they're adults now. But when they were growing up, there were all these things we never had. All these different sports and travel, hockey, and travel this, and 
travel ever. We didn't go anywhere. Well, I don't even know how we just went back in time, but we really did. That's why I told you. I never know where my show's right. going to go. Because now I want to stay back in time. Right. Remember, you actually did go to that corner grocery store, and you got the brown bag of groceries. Yeah. And you put Lots it on that list. scooter. Yep, the Lots list. list, yeah. That, that, this, that she this, rode this. half an Italian. <laughs> and and the thing was, if you ran out of, if you didn't have enough money, she gave you some money. But if you didn't, he'd say, don't worry about it. Yes. They, that, that Get was, me next time. That was a very common thing. Because we're going to be there the next day. We would meet, meet, be back possibly <clears throat> the same day. And we were just How's my time. credit? Yeah. I like my credit credit. That wasn't even a, that wasn't even a term that was used. They, they, they took care of it. It was always taken care of at the end, so. It was great to have that kind of network. You know, it's yeah. funny that when you think about the row homes and, you, and you, you think about the way you grew up, you could be going down the street on that piece of wood with the skates and a neighbor would pop out and say, are you on your way to the corner store? Could you do me a favor? Pick me up. Pick me up a half a pound of bologna. Right? <laughs> Not only that, um, someone would say, can you give me a pack of cigarettes? And these are just an adult. Because they would know you got this jar, so you get a pack of cigarettes. All right. Which I always thought was fun. Nowadays, it would be a like criminal having an eight-year-old get a pack of cigarettes. But we did that. My mom smoked. My dad smoked. That is fucking hilarious. Yeah. And we never thought about it. You remember that? Yeah. Could you do me a favor? Get a pack of smokes for your father. <laughs> And they gave them to you. Yeah, they didn't do it. So then we go back to the house, and there were ceramic ashtrays filled with cigarette butts. And yes. In the living room. In the living room. Next to the couch with plastic on it. Room. And a TV with uh, wire antennas on top that you only had channel one. Isn't that amazing? And the guy behind the counter gave you the spaghetti, gave you the meatballs, he gave you the pepperoni bread. And where's the pack of cigarettes? Slice, there you go. Slice in the... Yup. The provolone. Oh, man. How did the world get so bad? And now what do we do to get that kind of love? We go to Walmart. Right. And wander around aimlessly. Yeah. And can't find an open... An open can't find a cashier, so you got to do the self check You got to do it yourself. Right. That's a whole different story. All right, so... All right. Back in the day, he's growing up in Pennsylvania... When did you get hit with the bug to be a talent? I was I was a ham, like, right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. And I was doing voices when I was, like, five, six years old. And I would watch I would watch Ed Sullivan. And I would watch John Biner on Ed Sullivan. And it would be the summertime. or And I would come out in front of my neighbors who were sitting out on the steps, or the stoop, as they say. The stoop. I, I would come out and go, now, right here in our shoe. The fabulous Garbazzo brothers and Girl Scout Troop 625, girls stand up and show shit. Cookies. And my neighbors thought that was absolutely hilarious. How old were you? It was five, six years old. Right. And I was doing voices <laughs> and I, you know, I would do Colombo. Folks, I hate Bob. You know? And I would do all these different voices and they loved it. The funny thing was, I had a severe speech impediment. So when I did the voices, I didn't have the impediment. And then when I got into first grade, they diagnosed me and I did like eight years of speech therapy. And during that time, the speech pathologist and the speech therapist were basically teaching me how to do a lot of voices. Because they would say, you know, they would talk about, um, you know, you, 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 you know, what you do with your throat and your nose and your facial things and how to, you know, actual vocal production and the, the throat placement, the nasal placement, and you want to pronounce things properly and not hit things too hard. And so over eight years, I got rid of the impediment, but I got all this great education on how to do other voices. So what was the speech impediment? Like, what did you sound like? I sounded like Elmer Fudd. All my name, my brothers and sisters and my, my, everyone said I sounded like Elmer Fudd because I really couldn't control the way I talked. But when I did a voice... That went away. So they knew there was a way they could teach me how not to kind of I don't, get I don't, my tongue in the way is the best way to describe so it. So do they have to teach you where to put your tongue while right. you speak? Tongue like placement. Tongue. Yeah, yeah, it's all that tongue placement stuff that you learn later on when you're, when you're doing voices, when you're doing all your characters. So my thing was it was just in the way and I had to learn to pull it back. So if I'm doing most in Taoist, baby, and I'm doing English accent, the third, you know, everything's in... One place, and, and unless you're doing someone like Trump, you know, for him, it's very, very important how you over 
it enunciates certain words, you know, and then the high, the low, the cadence, all those things. It's really important. So I was very lucky to be able to get beyond the speech impediment, do the voices. And also, I'm like you, I love to perform. I love getting in front of an audience. There's nothing, there's nothing more gratifying or affirming as having someone laugh, either at a voice you did or a joke you wrote or some face you made. I mean, like, that's like the greatest thing. You ain't kidding. I don't even know how that happened. So at this young age, do you start entertaining in like uh, school, grammar school? Every, everywhere I could. Everywhere I could. The, what I remember, the first dollar I made, it was a little older now. It was probably eight or nine. But my, yeah. all the kids in the neighborhood knew I did voices and I was fearless because, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't shy. Um, but they had like a Sears delivery. And they're like, this, he does impressions. He does impressions. So I did my little mini act with Groucho and, you know, Elvis and all of these different voices. And uh, and the guy gave me a dollar. And I framed it. That was oh, my, no my shit. first live performance was on the street I grew up on. You know, well, I got paid. It was a professional gig. <laughs> oh, so, so now let's say you're in uh, the high school years of your life. Mm -hmm. What'd you do? Decide to go from Pennsylvania to New York? Uh, you bit with the acting bug? Where'd yeah. you go? What'd you do? I had a plan because uh, we didn't have a lot of money. So I thought I need to get a job. And I want to go to New York. So I said, I'm going to start as a copywriter, as a writer in Philadelphia. And I was a copywriter and I was going to build my book. And, and during all this time I was performing, I was in sketch comedy troops, I was doing stand up, I was doing anything, just anything. Um, and once I had my book, I was going to move to New York and have some money because, you know, New York's so expensive. And I, and I hated it. I hated having a job. I did it for like a year, ended up in this comedy troupe, and we actually started getting gigs around the country. It's called Schizoid. And I was able to in start... In New York City? Uh, no, in the Philadelphia area. Right. But we ended up like in the Virgin Islands performing at clubs there. And places in Delaware, and New Jersey, and I was like, "Oh, this is I like sketch comedy." The entertainment business—you never know where you're going to end you up. Never know. You're living in a row home, and before you know it, you're on an island doing sketch comedy. <laughs> but it was so cool. Like a guy for me, I'm like, I'm in, I'm like in paradise doing yes. sketch comedy, and I'm getting paid for this, and staying in a hotel it was like. Within the sketches crazy. you were doing, were you doing just straight sketches or were you doing impersonations? I was doing impersonations. I had a whole sketch called Bad Pickup Lines. We had another guy, John Malforda, who was a great, great comedian. And we would just be at a bar picking up all these women. We had the worst pickup lines. But it was a funny sketch with a payoff at the end. Right. You know, so every everything worked out. And I would try to put in as many characters as possible and add my stuff in. And, and then it was great for writing. And then I kind of like veered back to stand up for a while and did a couple of years where it was really really working um my stand-up and then that that you know is just brutal just brutal so i um i kind of veered back off of that but then the acting stuff started to happen so i went to new york i was doing more theater and more um back in another sketch comedy crew group and then improv so it was all these different this amalgamation of things and every now and then i'd get a commercial and that would be some real money um and that, you know, so it's, it's always this process of, you know, working and how, how, how is it over here? And how is it over here? And how is it over here? You know, and you kind of run it all together. And I really lucked out, you know, years later. And I made a living. I've always made a living. But, you know, when Trump announced, I was just in the right place at the right time because I started doing him in like 2004. So I had a really long runway and I had already the wigs and makeup and a lot of people who were watching. Well, when, when did you decide that in being in personator would be the way to go because now let's set let's track backtrack just a little yeah bit. i met john everybody because of another impersonator uh robert nash right and robert nash uh was well known for doing robert de niro because he looks like robert de niro without even saying anything he's right. got the perfect little pimple waiting for him and he makes the face and he, he just like like a young de niro so I think he came to one of my shows here at the Tropicana. We became friends. We started doing some sketches. And that's when he told me about you. Right. And then I remember going to your house. And I closet. saw your closet with all your wigs and outfits and people. And I'm saying to myself, okay, this guy is a genius. Because I saw you doing Trump, and I figured, well, he does Trump. I got a De Niro guy. 
I gotta have a Trump guy. And then I saw your closet. I'm like, wait a minute. A lot of characters. How many people do you do? And are you a Zodiac killer? <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, you even have, which which I would like to have someday, the little heads that you put the wigs on. Yeah. And that collection, I think, in anybody's closet would be petrifying. Yeah. Because there's got to be, what do you have, 10 wigs? 15? Oh, 30. 30 wigs. Yeah. And the outfits. Yeah. So now I'm thinking, okay, this guy's a phenomenal Trump impersonator. Then I saw you start doing the other people. You just gave us a taste of one of your first impersonations. Yeah, Columbo. Columbo. Yeah. And back at that time, Columbo was the person to impersonate yes. because he was huge yeah. on television with a TV series. And of course, Peter Falk he was an had, amazing a, had a glass eye, right? Yeah. He had he so, had the, so you had to figure out how to do this. Oh, God, he hit the He hit the All right, so that was that, was that your first guy? Oh, no, no. I think Ed Sullivan was first, and Groucho. I love Groucho. Hello, I must be going. I came to say, I cannot stay. I must be going. Because I love the Marx Brothers. To see, like, actual brothers who were just tattoos in stitches. And, and we had a kind of a tough upbringing. And it was really nice to laugh. I just love laughing. It kind of it takes you out of all the crap you have to do. The Marx Brothers, one of the original comedy troops that was a family. Yeah. How did you not love these people? I grew up watching the Marx Brothers, and not so much the Groucho Marx show, but I yeah. was like blown away by Harpo Marx, who got laughs without saying a word. Right. Then the other brother, who was Italian, who played the piano better than anybody you've ever seen. Who played Italian? Who played Italian? It was. They were all Jewish. Isn't that amazing? Like, how did he do that? Check out. Why did he do that? Yeah, they were all just phenomenal talents. And then Zeppo, who really didn't do much. Who went off to be a, um, who ended up being a, an agent, a big Hollywood. Really? Actor. Yeah. Wow, so yeah. you know the whole history. Oh, I've read a bunch of books on them. And I wanted to know, like, why they were, you know, we, why were they so funny? And why did they work together so well? And they just created these great characters. And, you know, Groucho was a grouch. He was a curmudgeon. And Chico was this ladies' man who was this amazing piano player and so funny. And then, like you said, Harpo, another great musician who just was an incredible mime. I so miss that. Am I, am I thinking wrong that it was like on Sundays? Every Sunday you'd come home from church and you would watch there would be another movie, one yeah. of their movies. That and um, the Bowery Boys. Yeah. Slip and Satch Mahoney. Right, right now, real quick, I, I already see people are starting to line up and say, start doing the impersonations and take, they're going to take the requests. I, have to I got requests sure. coming in right now. I knew this was going to happen, but excuse me, I'm the host of this show, and I'm getting my favorite ones done first. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, then why don't like someone just said do Burgess Meredith. Oh, yeah. Rocky! Rocky! <laughs> yeah. Well, ew, ew. This, this assumption that Mickey, could actually cut me, you. Why don't we do something like that? All right. So, if uh, why don't you do your first impersonation that you've ever done? Oh, I know. Then on. definitely do. Uh, uh, actually, here we go. Wait, come with request. Let me set it up. Yeah. Um. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got our first request for a, an impersonation. From John Di Dominica. Di Dominico. Di Dominico. Di Dominico. I don't always say co. co. I don't know. Co is. Go. Yeah. Go ahead, do Johnny Carson. Well, hi, folks. It's me, Johnny Carson. And I'm so excited to be back here in Las Vegas, <laughs> Nevada. It was so hot here today. The, the uh, what, what's a good Carson hotline? It was so hot in the valley. Uh, there were robbers without ski masks on. <laughs> 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 Someone at the police department stole all the toilet seats. They've got nothing to go on. Right down. <laughs> I actually am a big fan of, and I want you to do this. Um, we were talking about it before now. Uh, right. Columbo. Right. He's great. All right. I'll do Columbo again. Because he's a <laughs> Folks, I hate to bother you. I'm a little confused. How does this Facebook thing work? <laughs> Are we on two things at once or three, sir? Oh, one more thing. One more thing. Do you validate for parking, sir? Because it's very expensive here at the drop. 
What a legend. He was such a big, big star. That was great. How the hell do you keep one eye straight but the other one crooked? Well, if you can do this, this is what I this is what I taught myself. If you can do this, if you can look at your nose like that, then just just isolate one eye. Like that. <laughs> I can't see a thing. You, know, <laughs> you look like Bert Lahr from The Wizard of Oz when you did that. Who's Bert Lahr? He was the uh cowardly uh cowardly light. Oh really? Yeah. How did I do it? Yeah, I don't know what you, whatever you did. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You got the lower register and everything. Yeah, I got the lower register. I don't know what the hell that means. <laughs> I do one that, you know, when, when Mike Myers came on Saturday Night Live and I saw him do a bunch of his characters, I was like, I can do all those voices. And then he did Wayne from Wayne's World. And I was like, all right, excellent. Hi. I'm Wayne Campbell from uh, Illinois. Excellent. Schwink. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so when um, Austin Powers came along a couple of years later, I was like, oh, I know I could do it. And you've seen me as Austin. So it's like, Smithy, groovy, right to one, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we shine now or shine later? Let's do both, baby. <laughs> It'll be hey. Of course, all these impersonations get like heightened because you have the costumes in yeah. great detail. Yeah. I don't know where you get the teeth. I had that from. made by a special effects dentist in Los Angeles. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Anytime I need anything, I just have it. You know, like the when I did my when I first started doing Trump in two thousand and five, I was still in New York, and I went to Bob Kelly. And the, Bob Kelly did all the Broadway shows. He also did Saturday Night Live. So he made me my first, he made me my first Trump wig, and it was absolutely fantastic. Believe me, believe me, no one made wigs. Like, Bob, I didn't have a wig, though. I, I, just, my, I just my own beautiful hair, nothing to put on. It's a tremendous one. I love the way you did Trump, man. He's, he's, he's such a great character. He's the best, best, best Trump impersonator in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, and he's here in my apartment, live from my mother's basement. Here comes another request. Do you do Christopher Walken? Yes, of course. <laughs> Christopher Walken. Wow, Mike. So good to see you here in Las Vegas. The funny thing about Walken is, and a lot of people don't know this, when I was really developing Trump, I always put like different voices together. Uh, and I already mentioned Groucho. So when I was working on Trump, I was trying to come up with that, you know, that sing songy way that Trump speaks. And I was thinking, well, who else is from Queens? Because that's where Trump is from, right? And I thought, who else is from? I was like, oh, Christopher Walken is, is Queens? from Queens. Oh, and he's got that staccato sound. And if you listen very closely, Trump has that same kind of staccato. Stigat, I love that word. And also, there's a little bit of Groucho in Trump. Where's Groucho from? Groucho is from the Upper East Side. No kidding. Yeah, so his his thing was, hello, I must be going. I came to say, I cannot stay, I must be going. So if you listen to Trump's voice, he's got that sing-songy kind of, even though he's from Queens, he's got that kind of sing-songy way that he speaks in that very unusual cadence. So if you take Walken and you take Groucho and you put them together and all those other elements, that's that's how I put my Trump together. Everybody does some things a little differently. But I, I, I love Walken because he's so unique in the way he speaks. Mike, you know, just like, ah, oh, he's just such a great character. What was the movie he was in when he sat down and the guy would said something to him like, uh, you know, a lot of Italians come from Sicily and um, I forgot that actor's oh, name. Dennis and he Hopper. was like, yeah, it was Dennis yes. Hopper. Yes. And he's sitting and he started laughing and then he shot the guy. Was that True Romance? I think it was I True think Romance. I think it was True yeah, Romance. Yeah, it was great. That was a, How great was he yeah. in that movie? Yeah, he was he was awesome. Like, and he just was like laughing, and he goes, "I like this guy really." Like, and boom, and he shot him. It was wild. What, was it the opening of Pulp Fiction where he was talking about having to? He, I took this watch, stuck it up my ass for five years to give it to you because he was in he was in like prison with the guy or something or Vietnam. So someone probably knows. Christopher Walken. And speaking Walken. of Vietnam, I think one of the best movies he was ever in. I know you're going to say Deer Hunter. Yeah. So incredible. Can you do a scene from Deer Hunter? Um, 
Well, I could just do the just pretty freaky. Yeah, right, right. It's pretty heavy movie. Yeah. It's a pretty heavy movie. But Maybe it's just that's a not for this type of show. Beautiful but... film. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll blow my brains out. Well, I used to impersonate the one guy who was in that uh, uh, thing that they put in the water. And he was like this, Michael. These rats in here, Michael. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> Someone's asking for Nicholson. All right. Yes, well, yes, well, yes, I can do that. Are you ready? Yes. Hi, folks. It's me, Jack. And everyone's got a Jack Nicholson impression. Well, let me tell you what. I think we should get all the Jacks together and have a big Jack off. What do you think? <laughs> Jack Nicholson from Jack. New Jersey. Yes, yeah, from Spring Lake, right? Is he from Spring Lake? Him and De I uh, think De most De of those guys were all from Newark Union. Of course, we just lost a great actor. Um, Ray. Ray. Yeah. Leota, who's from Union, New Jersey, and uh, Jack Nicholson's Newark. Um, Jack, I just love the way he speaks. Talk about a great character now that he's older. One of the greatest Jack Nicholson monologues, I think, in the history of his career is in A Few Good Men. Yeah. And when he sits there and he Legend. says, I'd rather you just take a gun and man the post. Oh, I really don't give a damn. Whatever the fuck, that was just the greatest speech well, when ever. He, when he points at uh, uh, Kevin Pollack, who's going to do it? You, Weinberg? Yeah. Just, just, just eviscerating the guy, you know? You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Such a great scene. Or how about when he was in uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and he's sitting next to that big chief yeah, guy. Yeah, chief. And he hands him a piece of gum. And he goes like this. And he goes, you fooled him, Chief. Yeah. You fooled him. <laughs> you can talk, you son of a bitch. Such a great movie. Right? When he walks in, they think he, he's, he hasn't lost his mind yet, but they, yeah. he's kind of lurching back in. Yes. You bunch of maniacs. That's when he was younger, Jack. It's such a great character. All right, anybody else? On the so you develop, you develop in all these impersonations, what becomes your favorite? Um, I think Austin Powers, and, and, and here's why. I've got I've had the opportunity to do him all over the world. I've, had, I've done him in Bangkok, Thailand. I've done him in Germany. I've done him in Iceland. Stop there. How do you how do you even get booked in Bangkok, Thailand, and why? Who calls you up and says, you know what? Uh, how would you like to come to Bangkok, <laughs> Thailand? So you know, um, I do a lot of corporate stuff. Yes. So I do a lot of corporate work, and uh, the way people like me, because of what I do, I, I, you know, I like to, I always like to work. And if it's not a comedy club or a public thing, I do a lot of corporate work. So there might be a national sales meeting for Johnson Wax or Verizon or Mako. I've done Mako's meeting for 21 years. So those meetings last about a week. They're usually in a beautiful location. And I, I'll do four or five characters over the course of those that, that meeting, those three and a half days. So I, it makes me a better writer, a better performer, and I add more characters year over year. That's how I ended up doing uh, Guy Fieri, baby. Holy moly, Stromboli. You know I didn't mean? know you did Guy Fieri. No piece of taco grease, baby. Yeah, I had the, got the wig made and uh, the glasses and the earrings, which hurt my gal. So um, you have 30 wigs in yeah. that closet yeah is it because you have 30 different characters at some point yeah at some point i was doing a lot more you know i used to do like larry king and obviously a lot of these things have aged out uh for audiences especially corporate audiences but when you do like franchise companies those guys are a little more middle aged and they have a longer kind of memory of of the characters uh that i love i like classic characters oh al pacino yeah Ah, that's, a good one. that's coming from uh, our friend from Autism Radio out of New Jersey. So, do you do uh, Al Pacino? Yes, I do do Al Pacino, but you gotta be—I gotta be really loud. For that's Al Pacino. all right. Do whatever you want. All right. So, if you ever saw this, I love the way he kind of expands words. So, if you ever saw The Devil's Advocate, he does this great scene about what you know about God. God is an absentee landlord. <laughs> God's got you a hopping from one foot to the next. God doesn't care. <laughs> but that's late Pacino, you know, because Pacino's voices changed so much over the years. But I love that hoo -ah! 
that whole later thing where he's just really over the top. I Isn't it amazing that. how his voice did change it so did. much? Because if you watch him in The Godfather, oh, yeah. he was so like uh, down, so quiet, and reserved, and then all of a sudden now it's kind of like. How about John Travolta? I never, I never. Um, I guess that would be more of the John Travolta from uh, Welcome Back, Cotta, you know. But I, I never really focused on that. I didn't think it was a big voice. But there's a little bit of when. Travolta spoke, I always felt there was some, a little bit of like, you know, Stallone in there. You yeah. Know, and Mr. Cartel, you know, what are you doing? You know. I guess, like everybody else, they phase out. Yeah, they do. So not a certain generation of people wouldn't even know Welcome Back, Connor, no. at all. But what a great, what a, what a great Wasn't show. that the greatest show? Yeah. Set even Game Ka Kaplan was a legendary comedian and well, you, you don't even know where the other guys are. Yeah, and you know, it's funny, when I was, one of the voices I did early on was Nixon, because I had bought an album. The first album I ever bought uh, was Nixon, A 40 to Fantasy, and on that album, it was like 40 different voices, with a guy named David Fry, you can look, the album's called Nixon, A 40 to Fantasy, it was hilarious. The whole thing was like, like, it was like a comedy show, where he did a whole bunch of voices, and the person who did the remaining voices that David Fry could do was Gabe Gabbard. Oh, was that right? Yeah, and I have that album to this day. And then within a few years, he got Walking Back Cotter. And it was, you know, that show was... The numbers were just... And scary. who did Gabe Kaplan impersonate many times on the show? Groucho. Groucho. Yeah. And that's yeah. something... It's great, yeah. I wonder how they the even, legacy of I like, shot an elephant in my underwear. How he got my underwear? Oh, I'll never know. Something like that. Right. right. We took some photos of the, well, the... My favorite line is, we took some photos of the native girls, but they weren't developed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got all these people, and then, of course, the legendary uh, impersonation that a lot of people did that really don't do too much anymore. Rocky. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because my voice is pretty high. I'm like a tenor. But if I wake up really early in the morning, I can easily do Rocky because i got to get my voice slower. Yo, Adrian, where are my turtles? Cough and wink. Yo, Butkus, help me find my turtles. You know, I love those lower register voices when I can, when I can do them. People are like, Arnold, you know what I mean? I love those. I love the way he speaks. You know what I mean? He's so intense. Did you ever get requested to show up as, like, a Rocky or uh, anybody? When I was, yeah, I've done Rocky. When I was in Philly, there was always a call for, for Rockies. A buddy of mine was, like, the official Rocky. There was a bunch of Rockies. Who? Because uh, they made a documentary on him. Is it the same guy? He lives the life of Rocky? Yeah, yeah. Like I know him. him. Um, God. Cas Kuna? Yes, yeah, yeah, Something yeah. like that? Yeah, I mean, he really... He lives he, the life of but Rocky. But he looks like Rocky. I mean, he really... Yes, he looks, looks like, like him, Rocky. walks like him, talks like him, and not only that, he gives you tours of in, what in character. Story. Yeah, he'll go to the neighborhood. I wonder what that would be like if you own that apartment or that row home. Right. And you're like, look, Rocky's not here. Get away from my house. Go <laughs> see this guy. I don't even know if they actually filmed the interior of Rocky in that place. Was it someplace else? Oh, yeah, yeah it was a studio. It was a studio. Oh, okay, now wait a minute. Now, here comes a great impersonation um, request from my friend Joyce. Okay, do you do Archie Bunker? Yeah, yeah. All right. But I, I haven't done it in, like, forever. That will be call for Archie Bunker, but she was staring if you think that you. Boy, oh, jeez. She's <laughs> there. You with the lady, you know. Too bad we couldn't really go into, boy, the way Glenn <laughs> Miller played. <laughs> so Oh my throat! Guys like us, we had, had it made. Those were the days. And when you were there, girls were girls and men were men. <laughs> we could sure use a man like Herbert Hoover again. Didn't need no welfare no state. Everybody pulled their weight. G.R.O. LaSalle ran great. Those were the days. <laughs> you with the finger. <laughs> All right, maybe you I fucked that up for everybody. That was the best thing. Oh, jeez. I 
never been on key in my entire life. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of Archie in my in my dad. He was a World War II veteran. Archie Bunker was yeah. the greatest character on television. I mean, come on. Yeah. They were rich to us because they had a detached single home. Yes. <laughs> no, that was a row home. It was a row home, they but they were detached home. though. They didn't have, you know, the exterior. They had an alleyway. Yeah, they had an alleyway. They had an alleyway, but... They didn't even have a driveway. They had an alleyway. Where was that supposed to take place? That was Queens. That was Queens? Yeah. Isn't it funny some of the biggest hits were always New York? Right, and they were never shot there. Never. Where's the original... Uh, what I say, sitcom. The original sitcom took place in New come on, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. And who are we talking about? Lucy and Desi. Oh, oh, oh wait. Oh, uh, Car Fifty Four. Where are you? No. Uh, honeymoons. Oh, the honey. Jeez. Honeymoons. Bensonhurst. Yeah. Bensonhurst Thirty One, Oyster Bay. Right. That was. Great character. And when, what was he? He was a bus driver. Yeah. Um. And the statues outside of Port Authority. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Isn't that Does anybody even notice that? I don't. I always do. Probably a million people a day walk by that head. Isn't it funny? That no, nobody's even registering that. That's Arch. That's um. Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason. The great one. And he was Ralph Cramden. Yeah. Imagine that. The Honeymooners. The Honeymooners. Remember him? You got it, Jackie Gleason. Justice. Justice. Yeah. Um, I'd have to. I'd have to. Um, one day, Alice to the moon. <laughs> that that little he can actually player. he can actually say that on television back then. Oh, he was always threatened. Imagine that. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Oh. <laughs> oh, what about when his, his mother-in-law came <laughs> over? Blabbermouth. Blabbermouth. <laughs> you remember? Oh, that? oh my God. Their mother's a blabbermouth. You, know, you just remember <laughs> that whole thing where he was so upset and no one. He you. I'll hold your coat, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Icardi, brilliant. Did you know that um, in the Broadway version of um, The Odd Couple, it was Mathal and Art Carney? Oh, is that right? Yeah, but for some reason, he didn't end up doing the film. He had some kind of a commitment, and that's when Jack Lemmon came in. Jack Just, Lemmon? Jack Lemmon, the, the original Odd Couple. Oh. So on Broadway, it was Mathal and Art Carney, but when they went to make the movie, which was a smash hit, the play was a big hit, but the, the movie was, you know, huge. Wow. I mean, since we're talking about acting stuff, and you know, careers funny. and choices. And you just said Buford T. Justice. Buford T. Justice. And someone just said, can you do him in Smokey and the Bandit? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It was in my head. I'd have to, I'd have to hear it. You some bitch. Yep. I just love the way he did that, man. He was a great southern, you know, when he was ordering the food, and the toilet paper was stuck to his shit. Yo. <laughs> he was so, oh, he was great. So many great What people. a great movie. Remember yeah. that? Break one nine, break one nine. <laughs> I listen, when I'm like, I need a little pick-me-up, I listen to Eastbound and Down. Oh, is that right? And, oh, it's just such a great song, the banjo picking and everything else. Yeah. You know. So how about female characters? You know, the only one I ever, I, I knew so many uh, other perform as I was getting older, so many other impressions. And I know that it's a big, it's a big part of the British theater for guys to do women. I just was never into that. But I loved Mike Myers, Linda Richmond, because she was a New Yorker and she would always, you know, um, talk between yourselves. I'll give you a topic, Rhode Island. It's neither a road nor an island. You know, he was, it was a very funny character. Well, we can't really uh, close this show without mentioning a legendary impersonator mm. who's performing tomorrow night in the 7 o'clock show here at the Tropicana. And he's been around for a very long time. He was one of my mother's favorite characters to watch on television. He was known mostly for being on The Tonight Show and, of course, from the Dean Martin roasts. Right. Um, he was amazing. You know, when you go back and look at those roasts, and see the people who were on the dais, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Jack Benny, George Burke, and he was there. Red buttons. Red buttons. But he, and, and everyone knows who we're talking about, I'm assuming it's, it's uh, Rich Little, and he's here uh, doing his classic material, and it's like, when you think about the people he interacted with. Yeah. And very few of them are still alive. Not only is he alive, he's performing. Yes. 
He's just amazing. Nice guy. Love hanging around with him. Get to see him from time to time. Rich Little is just unbelievable. Uh, he shows videos of himself being on those shows from back in the day. And that's when you really realize, okay, he's got that person down. Yeah. He was also on a show. I don't know if you remember. It was called The Impersonators. Right. And uh, Frank Gorshin was on that show. A bunch of other I people. Love, I, was a, I got to meet Frank at the end of his life. He was great. He was a great impressionist. His James Cagney. I'm a Yankee doodle dandy. Mm. He was just yeah. he was so yep. wiry. And, so, and he was a great actor, uh, too. Because uh, mm, mm, mm. he was on uh, <laughs> Star Trek. And he did a lot of really great stuff in 12 Monkeys, which was decades right. later. Let's see if we can't actually um, jar people's memory. Um, Frank Gorshin was on Star Trek, the original Star mm -hmm. Trek. I forgot what that creature was called, but he was half black and half white painted. And he was in an argument with another guy who was painted identical. Right. And at the end of the show, they say, why is it you two don't get along? And he goes, you don't see the difference. You don't see the difference. And they started getting really, really intense. And then you realize his left side was white and his right side was black. And the other guy's yeah, left was, side was black. His left side it was brilliant. Wasn't that cool? Yeah, it was really, really brilliant. And he was great. It, it, near the end of his life, when I, not like the end of his life, but who knew it was that time. But I got to meet him maybe 15 years before he passed away. He was a heavy smoker. But his voice had gotten so kind of, you know, so deep. He started doing George Burns. And he started doing this George Burns. It was so, so incredible. And he was not the biggest guy. And he was very thin. He was a very slender guy. He did a show <clears throat> on Broadway as George Burns. And it was phenomenal. And that's kind of how his the last... Is that right? Yeah, it was just amazing. And a great his, voice, great voice artist. I thought his biggest claim to fame was when he was the Riddler. Oh, for sure. In the back oh, end. for sure. But, I mean, as an actor, and they took him very seriously... The Riddler. Uh, the Riddler. Yeah, the Riddler, right? Riddler. Yeah. Not Cesar Romero as the Joker. Cesar Romero as the Joker. Yeah. Wow. What what classic stuff here. Yeah. So tell everybody where they could find you if you're out there on the internet and you want to see where John's performing. Um, well, I'm the voice of Trump on the Howard Stern show. And if you for five years I was Trump on Conan. I'm Currently, the if I'm available, I'm the Trump on Kimmel. I'm also the voice of Trump on James Corden, who's now leaving, and I was the voice of Trump on Chelsea Handler. Uh, but if you want to see any of my stuff, just put in John D. Domenico. Uh, most of my um, social media is the Johnny D. Show, unless it's uh, YouTube, and it's just John D. Domenico. And you'll know it's me because it's pretty much all Trump. But I do a lot of different characters. We've seen you a lot on the Kimmel show. That must be a lot of fun. Yeah, that's really great. And yeah. I've gotten to work. I actually was at the studio um, during COVID, and we got to shoot some great stuff. And then I've done a bunch of stuff remotely for him. But it's always it's always a lot of fun. You know, it's so honored. There's only like a couple of late night shows. And then I've worked on Conan for five years, and it'll be on Kimmel, and all these different things. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. So. Tell everybody what it's like to work on Let's Make America Italian Again, the web series, which is on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Well, now, didn't you have fun working with I had, I had a blast. We had a great crew. We shot some great stuff. And we were ahead of the curve. I mean, we were we were ahead of the curve with all that. True, country. too. Yeah. So I'm really excited about this uh, next, you know, these next few years and making more comedy with you and sharing the stage with you and just doing great stuff and making people laugh. During these tough yes. times, you know, just making people laugh. That's all we're about. That's all I'm about. I'm not, I don't have a political agenda. I just happen to do Trump. I just want people to have a good time uh, with any and all of my characters. So you got all these characters. They're all in the closet. And I saw that. Do you do any characters that are not other famous people? I like, used to do, you know, I used to do... I used to do a nerd character called Melvin. You know, he looked like Fire Marshal Bill. Yeah, he's just a very, he's just a very nice guy. You know what I mean? He thinks a lot of himself. You know, like I used to be a real model. <laughs> Women were all over me, and that kind of just a sweet, lovable guy. You know, I love. I have my you know old Jewish character. I had this guy I used to do when I worked in Atlantic City. He was a Diamond Club member. 
He was a real guy. But he always like, I'm a Diamond Club member, damn it. I'm a Diamond Club member. I, I'm supposed to get the buffet and it's not open yet. You know, so it was actually a lot of characters like the people here. So you love those characters. characters. I love those because characters. Because they exist. They're real, and... they're real people. You know, and even when you do your own crime, like I, that's that's like a family member. I have mine. some props that I put on a table over here. I was going to throw on a wig and see if I could uh, work on that, but you know, I just really want to talk to you about what you do. But um, I do have my uncle Tommy, and the uncle that I came up with was he existed, and that's why I like to do it. When I first started doing stand up comedy, I was really just doing my uncle, and these are his glasses. Wow. Remember these bifocals? Yeah. They're all they're falling I apart from them. From putting them in the in the car, but he would wear these glasses, which would scare the bejesus out of little kids because it made his eyes so big and fat. You know, look, look, huh? Where where the hell's your brother, stupids? He called everybody stupid. You know, just he, somebody would come out of this is actually oh his, his God, pipe, sounds like my... right? And he would go like this. What? Listen to your uncle Tommy, otherwise you're gonna grow up stupid, stupid. You're nothing but stupid. Everybody's stupid today do, from back in the day. Do the pipe again. <laughs> That's how my grandfather would have his pipe. Is that right? Like that, yeah. yeah. But I had uh, 16 brothers and sisters. And in the morning, we only had 10 pairs of shoes between us. So if you didn't get a pair of shoes, you had to walk to school in your socks. And we only had four pairs of socks. So in the morning, if you didn't get the shoes or the socks, you went to school barefoot because you were stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys they all love it. They all love stupid and moron. And yeah. they just like, loved it. It was inspiration from my uncle when I was a kid. You ain't going to be nothing. <laughs> You're going to be stupid to your whole entire life because that's what you, your mother and father created. Stupid kids. Stupid kids. <laughs> my, my grandfather had this super thick Italian accent. He, he didn't, they didn't teach any Italian to my dad or my uncles or my aunts or anything. And he would say, everything America. And then he would speak to his, my grandmother in Italian. In Italian. In Italian. Yeah, because it was a lot, you know, it was a, this was a different time. You know, my, my, dad, my dad was born in 23, so Italians weren't really beloved. Now. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Weren't the beloved people they are now. But we are now. Yeah. And some of the best entertainers come from an Italian background, especially from the East Coast, like John and I, who are from Italian neighborhoods with row homes on the East Coast. All right, let's get going. One more time, John. Tell everybody where we can find you on the internet and laugh a little bit. Find me on the internet, John D. Domenico. Most of my um, social media, it's the Johnny D. Show. But, you know, follow me. I'm always putting out new comment. I'm on TikTok. I currently have 6.1 million followers. I'd like to get 6.2, and I need you to do that. So if you love short short comedy, TikTok, if you love long form, go to YouTube. For everything else, find me. I'm always putting something out and sharing wonderful stuff like this interview with this guy who I've known and we're going to make more content make and more millions. comedy. Millions, I tell you. Millions. <laughs> millions. All right. Thank you so much for coming Thanks. down and hanging out. we got to get going. Let's make America Italian again, everybody. You know the platform. You don't know nothing. You don't see nothing. You don't say nothing. And how do I end every single one of my broadcasts by always saying the same thing? Don't Ready? take, yep. Don't, don't take, take no, no shit, shit from nobody. Nobody. <laughs> nobody at all. And listen to what he said. Don't you didn't see nothing. You didn't, we weren't even here. We weren't even here. Okay? All right. If anyone asks, if anyone asks. <laughs>Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying watching my podcast live from my mother's basement. We're having a lot of fun and I'm going to have a lot of great guests on the show in the future. So if you like it, hit like. You could also leave a comment. You could subscribe to my YouTube channel and watch other funny videos. And you could also listen to my podcast on your favorite podcast app like Spotify and iTunes.